Welcome to Excess Returns, where we focus on what works over the long term in the markets. Join us as we talk about the strategies and tactics that can help you become a better long-term investor. Justin Carboneau and Jack Forehand are principals at Validia Capital Management. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Validia Capital. No information on this podcast should be construed as investment advice. Securities discussed in the podcast may be holdings of clients of Validia Capital. Hey guys, this is Justin. In this episode of Excess Returns, Jack and I have an enlightening conversation with John Rakenthaler. John is Vice President of Research for Morningstar and has been in the company since the late 1980s, thus giving him a unique vantage point on the history and the evolution of the mutual fund business, investment strategies, investor behavior, and the realities of investing in the markets over time. John's flagship column on Morningstar, The Rakenthaler Report, is a must read for investors of all different levels. Our discussion today is wide ranging and his insights on passive investing, investment factors, the total cost of fund ownership, and the risk of making decisions based on macroeconomic factors are both insightful and humbling. He shares what may be the best academic paper on fund performance predictability few have heard of and how you can be half right but entirely wrong when investing in the market. We wrap up the discussion on the lighter side of things, testing John's knowledge of American literature and trying our best to get him on Twitter. But that seems unlikely if John's boss can't even convince him to join the FinTwit crowd. Thanks for listening to this episode. We hope you enjoy the discussion. If you find this talk interesting and valuable, please take a moment to leave us a review or comment. We appreciate it. John, thanks for jumping on with us today. This should be a fun and uh, good discussion. Uh, Like we were saying before, uh, the third time's a charm. So we're certainly happy to uh, have you on with us. Glad to be here. Thanks, Justin. So you've been at Morningstar since the late 1980s. Um, You have uh, been there for over 30 years and you've basically had a front row seat to the evolving fund management industry, the development of a very successful company in Morningstar and many different market regimes. I think we could probably have a podcast about each one of those things in sort of isolation. But what I wanted to do was maybe just start by talking to you about the future instead of the past. And when we look at the fund management industry today, you know, fees have continued to fall. Investors have continued to move towards passive investing products. And, you know, the large firms like BlackRock and Vanguard have continued to take significant market share. So I just wanted to sort of get your thoughts, at least to start out by just sort of thinking about what the next decade might look like for the fund management industry. And, you know, are you thinking we're just going to see a continuation of what we've seen in the past? And, also, if you could maybe address, do you think there is going to be a place for smaller, more boutique managers in the future, or are the big just going to get bigger? Well, one thing I've learned, uh, Justin, over time is that it's a lot easier to predict the past than it is to predict the future. That's um, it's, act- it's a joke, but it's actually true. When I came to and started in the business, I'd say my greatest learning experience has been that although history is valuable and you need to know it, There are so many times when you think it's going to repeat and it doesn't repeat and one can over rely on on thinking that what has occurred in the last 10 or 20 years is going to continue to happen. So I approach the subject of of looking forward to the future with um, or predicting the future with some trepidations, so you say. I will say this, when I started in the business, you know, mutual funds were very much growing market share. They were taking business away from other forms of investments from direct stocks as well as, uh, you know, like, for example, in the 401k, 401k space from insurers and so forth. Um, that, you know, that's, that's, that game is over. Mutual funds are very secure. And when I say mutual funds, I mean ETFs too, uh, exchange traded funds. Mutual funds and ETFs both being Investment Company Act of 1940 and very similar. Um, and, apl- and appealing to a similar market for the most part. So, so what we have is a mature industry. And it's, it's a little hard right now to see how that's gonna change greatly over the next 10 years. If I'd answered this question in 2010, I think I would have given the same answer. I would have said, well, this industry is fairly mature. ETFs are growing their market share more than mutual funds, but overall, and 10 years out in the year 2020, it's not gonna look that different except for ETFs will have more money I'm saying the same thing for 10 years out now. Again, it worries me that to uh, predict that what's going to happen is what has happened. But it's difficult to see how or why that's going to change. In terms of this question about small boutique managers, 
Clearly they need a period where actively managed funds in some sphere beat indexes, beat indexes fairly soundly, publicly and loudly so that there's an interest in investors in active boutique managers. There just isn't that right now. It's a tough sell. And so then there needs to be some kind of success before that happens. That could happen. I mean, I can't predict. That's something I won't even try to predict. But I'll just say it won't happen for the boutique managers won't enjoy more success until they get a quiet success, you know, get, and that becomes publicized. They got, they got to do something first. It just hasn't been happening. Yeah. It's almost like uh, they need a period like from, you know, with like, let's say small mid cap value guys from 2000 to 2006, roughly. It was like a golden period for, you know, that type of manager and style. And I think, as a result of that, you know, you had maybe some smaller managers that had that type of investing approach sort of do well and raise assets. Um, it's obviously been a tough um, slog since then for those for, types of strategies. Right. But. For active managers to do well, what, what's really helpful is if there's a segment of the market that they avoid, that does badly. Mm -hmm. Not so much catching the one that goes up. That's, that's, that's hard to do. I mean, we've had that in the last few years with the, with the big technology companies becoming even bigger. And the active managers have had trouble being, they weren't overweight as a general rule in Apple and Amazon and so forth. But it's easier for them to avoid um, high priced or dangerous areas in 2000 and 2002 in the technology stocks, 10 years before international managers did very well by avoiding Japan. So, you know, we need a segment to go down that's kind of a hot segment that the active managers are not in. I mean, if Tesla goes down, that would help them a little bit. I'm like, guess there aren't so <laughs> it has a little bit at least. <laughs> yeah, it has a little bit, but yeah, uh, for a week. So it's only up 780% instead of 800% for the last year, whatever. Anyway, so it seems that, like it seems like one of the challenges for active managers is going to be is even when this good performance comes back, you know, the fee compression seems like that's a long-term trend. You know, that's definitely not reversing. And so even when they do have some outperformance, it's going to be a little bit challenging probably you know, to, to make money with it, given that the fees are not going to be anywhere near they used to be in the past. It's, it's a tougher business. Yes. I, a, yeah, one of the things that Morningstar founder Joe Mansueto used to say in private to us was even though his Morningstar was doing well, he's like, I should have started a mutual fund company instead. He used to say that 20 years back because the, because the, uh, you know, the margins are, are higher in that business and the mutual fund companies were just booming. I don't think he would say that now better to be in the publishing business as much as it, at times it might be tough. So uh, yes, it, it, it's, it, event, ultimately this will be opportunity, right? Because it's the, the fee compression and the lack of uh, sales among active managers is throttling um, new entrants. You know, they're not coming into the business. And as the old entrants go away, uh, the old players go away, there's gonna be less competition. But we're still in that shakeout phase, I think for a while. Uh, speaking of Morningstar and Morningstar's uh, businesses and, and products, you're partly responsible for the development of the Morningstar um, fund ratings and also the style box um, on Morningstar? Yes. Well, the fund ratings less so. Uh, that's mostly Joe was Joe's thing from the very beginning. The Morningstar star rating, um, which is a just it's a risk return measure. I mean, what Joe and what Morningstar brought to the business. When we started in 1984, there were two things that we brought to the business that really hadn't been done before. Because uh, there were other mutual fund tracking services and they were tracking performance and so forth. One thing that Morningstar brought was publishing the portfolios. So you could see what was in the portfolios and understand the strategies rather than just seeing a string of total returns. And the other was evaluating funds from a risk return perspective. This was just something Joe took from business school. Right? He went to business school and he learned from the professors that you should evaluate investments from risk return, not return alone. But the mutual fund tracking services at the time were doing return alone. So that's what the star rating does. That's basically Joe's. Don and Phillips and I tinkered a little bit later with some of the calculations, but the framework was his. Now the style box, Don Phillips and I, um, Don Phillips mostly, but I, I worked with him closely. We developed that one. Right, the, the, the familiar nine grid style box and the methodology behind it. That was, that was the, uh, you know, the Wild West days. The nice thing was you, almost anything you could do was new and people thought you were smart. Right. It was, uh, 
there was a lot of open territory. It gets harder as uh, more people are in the business and, and more smart minds are to uh, come up with something that's fresh and different. But what's pretty amazing though, is like those two, you know, the Morningstar fund ratings and also the style box. I mean, they have like stood the test of time. I mean, those are core uh, aspects to the way that, you know, someone, when they're looking at a funder and ETF, you know, what they, I think what they want to look at. Um, and I wanted to sort of ask you if you were looking at, and I don't really know how you personally invest your own money, but if you were, let's say, looking to get exposure to like small cap value stocks through a mutual fund or an ETF, could you just walk us through the things that you might look at if it, if you were searching for like an active strategy, you may prefer passive, but I'm just, what I wanted to sort of pick your brain on here is, you know, what features, statistics, maybe even holdings type analysis would, you know, John look at if he were an investor trying to find a, you know, a good solid fund in that category. To be honest, if I were doing that right now, and I'm, this is the only place I'm going to, I hope I'm going to sell Morningstar research because I'm not here to do sales job. But our analysts these days, and I'm not an analyst, I'm a columnist and I look more generally at, at these big issues that we're talking about, like indexing and so forth. You know, our analysts go by fund by fund and look into the sorts of things that I used to look into, which is, of course, cost of the fund is important and it's past performance, but stewardship. The, the record of the parent, have they had, you know, have they had a, how are the other funds in, in, in the family faring? Do they have a lot of manager turnover? Do their managers, portfolio managers tend to own the investments that their, the, their own funds, eat their own cooking, so to speak, which tends to be a good sign. Um, various, you know, various aspects of the entire organization as well as specifics in the fund has the fund had a consistent investment strategy? Has the, is the portfolio manager's story matching or, or, or the words matching what the portfolio says? So they do all those things and they come up with something that's called an analyst rating, which is a newer thing that we've done um, as opposed to the traditional fund rating. The, the fund rating is, looks backwards at history, risk and return. The analyst rating attempts to look forward and it's done by metals, gold medal, silver medal, bronze medal, those are the three positive scores. Then there's one that's called neutral and one that's negative. And, and it, we've done a study of, of, the, um, of the performance of these ratings. They've been out for several years now. And the gold medal funds did outperform on a risk return basis, the silver and as a general rule, which outperformed the bronze and so forth. The, the downside of that is, or, or the, the bad news to the good news is, this has been such a tough period for up for performance for active managers, and we're writing active funds, is that even the gold managers basically just match the indexes after cost. And then the silver did worse and the bronze did worse and so forth. But I would start by going through the, the gold funds because the analysts have done that kind of work, the sort of work that I would do already, and then look for gold fund, you know, look specifically for a fund type that might match investors' interests. And there should be a selection of, 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 of the golds. That's great. That's well, I'd say, let, you. you know, let Morningstar do the work for you in this case. So let the Morningstar analyst team, they're, they're, there are about 30 of them and um, this is what they do. I want to switch gears and ask you about passive investing a little bit. You know, yeah. there's no question that the rise in passive has been a good thing for investors. Um, you know, it's driven down fees. It's gotten money away from active managers who as a whole, at least, have not had very great track records long term. But there's some concerns that this is going to eventually become a problem here. And there's some concerns that maybe it's, it's already become a problem. And the concerns are basically as people invest more money in passive funds, you have this money coming into the stock market that doesn't care about valuations at all. The money just goes in at market cap weightings. And when an investor invests more in their 401k, the money just goes right into you know, the market cap weightings into the market as a whole or into the S&P 500. And I'm wondering, does that worry you at all? How to, how to, how to answer that? Um... I'm less worried about the issue of uh, money flowing into money coming into passive funds and passive funds investing blindly, because honestly, from a bigger perspective, that's how active managers worked as well. Active managers in general did not raise cash. You know, they didn't have success timing the market by the, the, and, and financial advisors and investors tended to communicate to them. I do the asset allocation, I want you fully invested. So active funds, so if we're looking at the market broadly and saying, is money flowing into passive funds 
that are just sort of investing, investing their cash blindly and, and pushing the market up. Well, the active funds would be investing their cash as well. Maybe not blindly, they'd be picking this stock versus that stock, but the same amount of money would be going in to the, into stocks. And I think have the same effect upon pushing up the stock market. The other thing is, and I wrote about this the other day, rather surprisingly, um, you know, mutual fund and ETF flows into equity funds have been negative the last several months as the market's been going up. And it, mutual fund and ETF, man, uh, investors have been pulling their money away from funds, even as stocks are going up. So someone else is, is, is pushing up this, the stock market, you know, whether it's the institutions or retail investors, or there are a lot of foreign investors as well these days and, and foreign, um, you know, institutional funds, big pension funds and so forth. But there are other parties involved here. So it gets very tricky when looking and trying to isolate is one particular party, you know, having an effect on the market because there are a lot of moving parts and we don't see all these moving parts. The funds are the most public or visible aspect that flows into funds, but the other, the rest of the marketplace is hard to know. That makes sense. Do you, do you think there is a point where we should be worried about passive investing? I mean, obviously we're like 40% passive now. It may not be that concerning. I mean, do you think there's a point where it could get to be too much? Of course there is. But the way I think about this is like with the Laffer curve, you remember everyone knows the Laffer curve, right? You draw a curve and you show that if you have 0%, tax rate, you never collect any taxes because you have a 0% tax rate. And if you have a 100% tax rate, you don't collect taxes because who's going to give you 100% of their money unless you put a gun to their head, they're all going to hide their income. So somewhere in the middle is the ideal place. But I think a lot of the places in the middle aren't that different. It's really, it really only works when you get to the extremes and we're at 40%. So I think if you go to 50, if you go to 60, for market share for, for passive, it doesn't make much difference. At some point, this absolutely would be true. If you were if we were 99.9% .9 in passive investing and 0.1 in active, well, it'd be a strange marketplace. That 0.1 could presumably really push prices around because they're the only ones like going short this stock or long this stock and making a difference. I just think we're a long ways away from that. It, it, it's true in theory, but not in practice yet. Okay, that, that makes sense. The other thing I want to ask you about, about the rise of, of passive is the whole corporate governance issue. Um, and, you know, this is something active managers talk a lot about, how they, they research these companies a lot more. They know the issues the companies are facing. And the vanguards and the black rocks of the world are not going to be as intelligent as they own more and more of these companies. They're not going to be as intelligent in voting the shares. I wonder, do you worry about that at all? Do you think there are any corporate governance issues with passive getting bigger? I definitely think it's a concern. It's not just, again, not, this is a theme of mine. It's not just passive. Because if a money manager, even if they're active, if they're very large, well, let's take, well, Fidelity's got big passive. Let's take the old Fidelity before they were big indexers too, from 15 years ago, very large. I mean, Fidelity between its portfolio managers owned everything. And you put this all together and you look at it from an organizational viewpoint. They owned all the stocks. They wanted them all to go up, the same as a passive manager. So I think they, you know, the, in those situations, these, these giant organizations, they end up thinking alike, whether they're passive or active. And it's a concern. I don't know what the answer is. There have been academic papers out there that say that these, there's slack corporate governance when you get passive investors or you get people that own all the investments. Then there are academic papers out there that say, no, the corporate governance is better because these people have their long-term shareholders. They're in it. They own all these securities. They're in it. They're gonna, they know they're gonna basically continue to own all these securities. If one manager sells it, another manager buys it, or if they're a passive fund, they're gonna own it in the index. And therefore they have like more of a Warren Buffett long-term mindset. They're not as impatient with corporations and they're willing to invest more or let their companies invest more. I think it's a great, it, this is a topic that's very important, needs further study and we're still we're still working through what it means as we're going through this, this change in ownership structure. There's, there's some thoughts that going into the future here, direct indexing is going to become, you know, maybe a leading way to index someone's portfolio. So instead of, you know, owning SPY, an investor can own the 500 stocks within, their, within the, the fund themselves in their account. They can do things like tax loss harvesting, or if they have beliefs about ESG or something like that, they can express their particular beliefs about ESG in terms of holding, say, 475 companies instead of 500. I'm wondering if you looked at direct indexing at all, and if you think that is a positive for investors, and if, 
what you sort of look at it as going forward? I, I like it in theory. I haven't spent a lot of time on this issue, but I like it in theory. I just don't think in practice it's going to become that common because of it's more work than just buying an ETF. I think back to 20 years ago, and I can't remember the name of the company, which I should remember because I visited them. <laughs> and actually, Morningstar was interested in learning more about the company and maybe buying it. But there was a, a well-publicized firm that raised a bunch of money. This would be 1999, so it was pretty easy to raise money. And you could, um, you could go in there and build custom portfolios for cheap. It was a version of this, of, of, what we're t of direct investing. And the idea was you don't have to just be holden to what's in your mutual fund. You can customize, you can tax loss harvest, uh, you, you can build your own portfolios. And it never really took off because it was more work. There's a, there's a segment of the pocket. I thought it was great, right? The investment junkies think it's great. But ultimately, I think these things are probably more tools for financial advisors uh, as opposed to something that the direct investor will embrace. That's just based on experience and, and what I've seen. Uh, I have nothing against yeah, the, it, but, but I, I think the, as, as you know, you can buy an ETF, it owns all the securities in the index, it's very, very cheap. If you duplicate that on your own, whatever cost savings you might have would be pretty minimal. And tax loss harvesting on individual issues, it ends up being, I think, a lot of work for not so much gain. And um, people tend to uh, have inertia when it comes to avoiding work. I know that I do. Yeah, you know, you could argue that something like a standard index fund works for most people. And, you know, this, this might be more of a niche thing rather than a large thing that with certain people in high tax brackets or something like that, it might work for. But, you know, in general, SPY or a standard index fund might work for most people. Right. And what we find is that people, especially as they get older, people in high tax brackets tend to have financial advisors. That's why I think of it more as potentially a financial advisor tool rather than some direct investor. Of course, there are people in in high tax brackets that are experienced investors that go out and do their own work and do their own investing. But that number does tend to dwindle. We see over time, you know, there's a, a uh, whether people feel that they need the professional advice because life's things are getting too complicated for their portfolios, particularly during retirement, or it's just a, it's natural to, to need and feel more security as you have less human capital left in your life and more of your capitals in the financial assets, you know? So I, I it seems to me this this is more suited as an advisor tool or this kind of practice. I want to move a little more towards active investing and ask you about factor investing. You know, there's a lot of academic research that shows that things like value or quality or momentum may produce an excess return over the market over the long term. And there's been a lot of funds that have obviously come up using those types of approaches. And, you know, in the real world, maybe it hasn't worked as well in the academic research, but there's been some positive results. So there's sort of two sides of this argument with factor investing. One is you can get some excess return. Your average investor should probably have some exposure to factors. The other is, well, most of this stuff will underperform and market cap weighting is perfectly fine for most people. I'm wondering how you think about using factors in an individual investor's portfolio and how, how they might utilize them or not utilize them. I think factors are fun. It gives me something to write about. Um, it, uh, when I opened, I talked about one of the things I've learned over 30 years is, is not relying as heavily on history as maybe I did as I as not maybe, as I definitely did when I began in this business. So when I started in this business, that was just when the information about the su previous success of value investing was being was coming out in the academic papers. It was two, it was three, four years before Fama and French put out their, their historic work on, on uh, showing that small investment style and value investment style had outperformed over the previous 50 years or so. But that, before Fama and French published that paper, that was still out there in a, it hadn't been researched quite as thoroughly, but anecdotally that evidence was there. And I believed in it wholeheartedly. I bought a small value fund. I put all my money I had in the time of the small value fund. It's done all right. Uh, you know, I don't, uh, my faith has been challenged since then. I tend over time more to go to a, a friend of mine called Alan Roth, who's a financial advisor. And he says his belief is because that the markets are more efficient than academic work that shows past performance for factors. So I'm leaning more toward that view where it's, you know, it, you're looking, you're going through past, all the data on fa uh, 
80 years worth of data on the markets and you have powerful computers and smart people, they're going to find statistically significant patterns. But knowing why those patterns existed and if they were ac accidental as opposed to real is very difficult. And, um, and even if you are, even if they did exist for real, just the fact that they've been identified and they're now out and known by people changes the equation going forward as well. So I'm not a factor investing is fine. I still have some small hopes in it, but I don't think that it's such an important and obvious um, research that people must do it or they'll be wrong. There's nothing wrong with market cap indexing. In fact, that's what I would tell somebody unless they really wanted, you know, to take it to the next, next level of involvement in their investing. For the casual investor, perfectly fine. That makes sense. Taking it all the way to the other end, to the furthest end of active in terms of the human fund manager, you know, throughout your career, you've seen a lot of star fund managers. And one of the things you'll notice in recent years is that's sort of gone away. Um, the, the, the great manager who's able to produce the long-term record of outperformance, those seem to be getting fewer and further between. And maybe some of the reasons you cited are why, but I'm wondering what you think about that and its, its place in people's portfolios. I mean, do you think we're just going to be in a constant decline here where we're going to see a lot less human discretionary management? And, and do you think human managers still have a chance to outperform the market? Or do you think that's going to become rarer and rarer? Well, the, the math is becoming a little more on their side each year as more money goes into passive and passive has a higher market share. Um, but as I indicated earlier, I think that process has a ways to go. Um, even though passive is 50% of equity mutual funds right now. And uh, pretty close, I think, to that of overall, when you look at equity assets between indexed mutual funds or indexed money that's in insurance portfolios or institutional portfolios and so forth, it's a very large portion. Still leaves a lot of active managers. And there are more CFAs out there than there were 15 or 20 or 25 years ago, which means more competition. So it, it, it's still a it, it's still a tough task. And we see that because as you put it, the star managers didn't disappear because uh, somehow the publicity train isn't working the same way. Although the publicity train does work differently because there's not Money Magazine to put you know, a star manager on the cover each month. But if you look at the numbers, the star, they, the star managers used to deliver. When, there were a lot of managers in the 1980s who year in and year out were matching or exceeding the indexes. I'm talking large cap managers compared to the S&P 500, smaller cap managers um, compared to say the Russell 2000. There was a consistency of performance among the better managers in a way that we don't see these days. So it, no question that it has become more difficult for active managers and the star managers have disappeared because the performance underlying them has disappeared. It's not that it was a myth that they were a myth before, I mean, sometimes you bought a star manager and the star manager's performance then turned poor, but the previous results were there. There was a time when, when active management in the mutual fund business was, uh, you know, if, if you were around the, associated with the right organizations and um, you had a good chance of, su of success. It's tricky now, yeah. Isn't it interesting that the best investor of all time isn't a fund manager? It's Buffett. Right. I mean, basically, it's kind of ironic that, you know, here's a guy now who I understand his performance, you know, the last 15 or 20 years, um, you know, wasn't like the first 15 or 20 years of his track record. But the point is, is that, you know, the best performing person out there, uh, you know, isn't r running a mutual fund. Luckily, at least he has a public record. So, you know, it's not just. Uh, right. Back or something. Yeah, exactly. He does have advantage that, that mutual fund. Uh, managers don't have right of leverage through the effectively through the insurance portfolio that Berkshire Hathaway owns. So he's able to, um, you know, to put that insurance money to work and, uh, you know, and controlling his cash flows and certain other things. But he could have done that as a, a, a as a mutual fund. He could have been very successful. He would have obviously been a very successful mutual mm -hmm. fund. And then his fund would have become very large and then he would have found it's more difficult. Now this is his doing with his with his company. By the way, I own Berkshire Hathaway and I think of it as a, as a very low cost fund that doesn't make distribute capital gains or income distribution. So it's tax friendly. It's like a free fund. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
He pays himself fifty thousand dollars. Right. Throws his jet around, but I think the expense ratio is mighty low. <laughs> then again, there is a you know I can get an even cheaper expense ratio, right, with a fidelity free index fund. All right, that's true. Yeah. Speaking of fees, um, and this was from a few years ago, you wrote, you wrote a paper in response to an article that was written by Jack Bogle, and it was talking about. Um, the all-in costs of actively managed fund. And you basically said for the first time, and you're referencing Bogle's piece here, you said for the first time, you know, you're seeing a table that has the six elements, the six costs um, that are actually in a fund appear in sort of one, one table. Um, and you talked about the costs that were attached to the fund. So those would be like the, the expense ratio um, and other costs. But then there was a second set of costs were, which were, the investor costs. And I was just wondering if you could maybe just talk through what the total cost of ownership is for an actively managed, you know, high price fund, because I think investors might just see the headline number and say, okay, that fund charges 1.2%. That's all I'm really being charged. But as you pointed out, and as Bola pointed out, you know, there's obviously um, a lot of other costs in there as well. Right. So with, with the fund, there's the there's the official expense expense ratio, which is the the one point two percent you mentioned, or much less than that these days for the larger funds and for the passive funds. But that's a fund's official expense ratio. Funds also have um, trading costs. So when they trade securities, they pay these days it's a pretty small commission on their trades. But they, they do pay a commission on the trades. That doesn't appear that money doesn't appear in in an official expense ratio. The larger figure that they also pay when they trade is the spread on the stocks. That does not appear. Those are considered, the, the commission and the spread on the stocks are considered investment activities. And so that they're not tracked as an official expense ratio of the fund. Um, in addition, funds make distributions. So if they're in a taxable account, then there's capital gain distribution, income distribution, they're required to do that, pay out 98% of their net gains or net income uh, so that's, that, that's a cost for taxable. And then again, this is decreasing, but funds in the past, you know, they had, there were a lot more funds that had front end loads or a back end load where you exited, paid an exit cost to leave the fund or a 12B1 fee where you paid in an ongoing way. Now that 12B1 fee that did show up in the, uh, in the funds expense ratio, but the entry load or the exit load did not. So quite a, quite a few places. It's hard to, um, you know, the all-in cost of of owning a fund. You can you can't compute it exactly because you don't know the the cost they paid in spreads on, on right. the trades. But aside from the spreads, you can find the other information and put it together. But it's still tough to communicate because it's time dependent. It, mm -hmm. You have to assume a starting point and an ending point, which almost because the five-year number is going to be different than the three years at least for funds that have entry and exit charges. So for the most part, you know, more, we tend to look at just an ongoing expense ratio. That's, that's what you can get, but there's more to it than that. Now, Jack sometimes would be aggressive with some of those, of some of his numbers, because um, he was trying to make a point about, that he wasn't necessarily showing us the best possible mutual fund cost scenario, right? Is right. Jack contrasting what Vanguard was doing with the higher end or more expensive portion of the industry. But so sometimes I would quibble with his numbers a little bit, but that the uh, structure that he had was, was exactly right. We, um, we ran an ETF for five years, so we certainly know, and it basically was like a small cap value strategy. And uh, so in terms of, you know, the commissions and the spreads and the slippage, you know, that was something we had sort of a front row seat to. And you're right. It just gets like buried and netted out. You know, I mean, well, the slippage, you don't even, you, you know it um, if you yeah. track it, but you know, on the commissions and stuff, it just gets netted out from the funds. So investors really never see that. Know. You don't know. So all you can do is, is back out of it, right? Look at the funds performance compared to the index's performance. You know, the official expense ratio and the remaining difference is something. right. It, 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 it could be due to the, these hidden costs. Or it could be due to tracking error. It's hard to, you can't know from the outside. Um, you uh, wrote a article, another one of your articles that um, we found very interesting. It was this using the ownership lens to select funds. And 
you actually wrote two articles. There was, and it was kind of keying in on this. I think it was an academic study, um, either a paper or an academic study that was titled Judging Fund Managers by the Company They Keep. And what it, um, I'm going to let you try to explain it, but it was a way to try to get at, you know, identifying good performing funds, basically, I think based on their, their holding holdings. Um, so is that something you could just uh, sort of explain a little bit more at what that actually is trying to do and some of the Morningstar findings of that ownership lens? You know how to ask a hard question. This is the best academic paper that nobody knows about. And the reason nobody knows about it is it, it's tricky to, to, to grasp intuitively. But I'll explain. This paper is from 2005. It was called uh, Judging Fund Managers by the Company They Keep. And the, the idea was, if you look at an individual fund and you try to analyze the past performance of an individual fund, there's a lot of noise there, right? It's a sample size of one, in effect. There's one portfolio. There's, there's, this fund has one portfolio. And there's quite a bit of luck involved with whether the, the fund, it's hard to differentiate between skill and luck because you've only got one portfolio and one series of returns for that. Professor said, okay, how do we get a bigger sample size? Professors love bigger sample sizes. And they said, what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at the holdings of, that this, the, of the portfolio. And we're gonna look, we're gonna count, we're just gonna see who else owns these stocks. So if your first stock is whatever, Apple, we're gonna see all the other portfolio managers that own Apple, and we're gonna weight it. So if they have a little bit of Apple, that doesn't count very much in our analysis. If they have a lot, it counts a lot more. And this is your top holding. And, and we're gonna go through this process for every stock you own to see which portfolio managers are most like, have funds that look most like yours and which ones look the least like yours. The idea being that this portfolio manager thinks mostly like you or your team of portfolio managers. And then we're gonna see how all those other funds do. So now we've got a really big sample size, right? It's not just one fund, it's all the funds. And if, and if these other funds tend to do well in aggregate, the ones that look most like you, we're going to say you're a good manager because you're, 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 you're in good company. You own the same kinds of securities that successful funds do. If the other funds, the funds that look most like you don't do very well at all, and the funds that look least like you do really well, you're a bad manager. So we're judging you by the company you keep. That's, that's the name of it. Uh, it's, it's tricky to, it, it feels very circular. It is circular. Right, because the investments that you own, these other people do well in part because they have the same thing as you. So it's kind of like measuring you when we're measuring them. It, it, it's, but it works. I mean, we know, when I say it works, the professors had a 15, 20 year time period going through the early 2000s of the US stock market and they measured it and they said, okay, well, you know, this, this has some predictive value. We could take it, we can take this at some point in time say, here are the best managers by our score and the worst managers, then out of sample, it tended, that tended to hold true. There was predictability. And then we looked at a completely different data set after 2005. And it wasn't just the US market, it was other markets too. And it still worked. And it worked, it was very statistically significant with large differences in excess returns. We need to do more with this. I wrote that in my column and we haven't. Uh, we haven't because, I, again, I think it's, it's just not, it's not very intuitive or it's difficult to explain, but there's, there's something powerful there. Um, it, it, but the core of the idea is to get more data, not to be stuck in this trap of measuring for one portfolio manager with one portfolio. Yeah. And you've got that noise and you don't know how to separate the noise from your analysis of skill. That's, that's the key to the, this paper. So I think it's a, it's just a great approach in general to how do, how do we get more data? You know, how do we get, how do we, smooth out the noise when we're evaluating active management. I think it's very interesting. I think where it might sort of have some uh, ch challenging periods though is when you have maybe a regime change where you go from something like the market changes and starts to favor value over growth or growth over value or certain types of stocks because what that would mean is that those managers that have done well in that period probably will underperform and they'll be replaced by a different type of style manager that does better. So in those transition periods, it would just be interesting to see how this 
type of assessment handles that. Exactly, exactly Justin. I, that, that was one of the things I thought. And, I, you know, I didn't believe, I had trouble believing and trusting this paper. It just seemed like it shouldn't work. And it, it was measuring something, you know, fairly straightforward like that, that was just an accident of a time period. But when you look at the numbers, it, you know, it plays out over long time periods with, with, some, with some pretty big margins. Mm -hmm. Now, I, we haven't looked, at least to my knowledge, at how it works at the time of a regime change. That would be very interesting. But it does seem to work in aggregate quite well. So, what, so that if you get punished during a regime change, that still doesn't overcome the benefits of this approach. We, we need to do more work. In fact, I, I promise you, I would just walk to the quant department the next floor up and talk to them. That was easier then, but now I have to send them emails. You know? <laughs> but I will go. I do miss that aspect of, of being in the office. For the most, I don't, but it was good to be able to walk. And you could talk to a whole group at one time, you know, get several of them and get a conversation going. That's a little harder. To, now I got to set it up via Zoom. You, uh, you wrote an article recently that really hit home for me. It was called The Danger of Investing in the Big Picture. Um, and the reason it hit home for me is because I've pretty much convinced myself that I can use macroeconomic factors to predict the market, even though I know for sure that I can't actually do that. And you wrote an article about how you sort of fell to that trap too this year when in March you were looking at the coronavirus situation and you thought maybe it could get a lot worse than it had gotten. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what you found in that article in terms of what it takes for an investor to use macro type things like that to actually predict what the market's going to do and why many investors should probably stay away from that. You've got to be so right to be right. I, I, I think, I don't think my, um, I can't remember what the title was, but I know my initial working title was how half right can be entirely wrong. And that's what I was, right? I, I was half right. I mean, it was late March. This was the very bottom of the market, by the way. And I was smart enough not to sell stocks and market time that way and get into cash and then you never get back in and so forth. But I wasn't so smart as to just avoid temptation and walk away from the telephone and, you know, or email and not, not contact my brokerage firm. Um, and I said, well, you know, just because it seems to me things are, are going to are gonna be worse than they're predicting for the economy in, in terms of GDP growth and in terms of uh, unemployment. And I was looking at the consensus estimates and at that time they were like three or 4% down in the second, no, a little more than that, maybe seven or 10%, 15% even down in the second quarter, but then a quick bounce back and so forth. And I thought that just didn't, it, it wasn't gonna work out like that. So I bought some put options on, on my portfolio, spent some money on put options to protect against further losses. Of course, that was the very bottom of the market. The puts expired worthless. I was right about GDP growth being, or GDP shrinkage being much worse than the consensus at the time. I was right that unemployment would be higher. I was right that this would linger longer in the economy. And my, and my put investment went to zero. So um, I think it's really, I, half right isn't bad. I mean, I was right on on, on the big picture of the economics and I still lost the investment because I didn't factor in the other things. I didn't realize how aggressively the, the, you know, Washington would respond with pumping money into the economy through the stimulus package and the, and the federal and the fed buying assets and, and, and it, just the, you know, this kind of wash of asset flow that would support the marketplace. Um, you've got to get it all right. It seems like, to, to make money while investing macro. And, and I knew that going into the trade, right? I'd written about this before, but sometimes it's, it's just so hard to avoid temptation. You, know, you see that apple on the tree and you know what happens if you take a bite and it just looks so good. And I did the same thing. You know, it's, it's tempting when you think you see this once in a lifetime type thing. You know, and COVID is one of those things and, and you think, you know, may, are, I'm not gonna do this all the time, but I'm gonna do it this one time. And you know, that, that's sort of the trap I fell in this year. And what, what's interesting is, even if I, and you talk about it in sort of a two-part decision, even if I gave you every fact about COVID it, before the whole thing happened and said, all right, you can invest in anything you want in the market, most people would have gotten that wrong. Because even with all the terrible economic news, the right move was not to short the market. And so it just shows how difficult it really is to try to pull this off. Yeah, so, you know, what was also doubly lowered me in the temptation was 
two weeks before I made the trade or three weeks before I had, when it was, no, a month before, when the very first COVID news started coming out, I had this sense of, and I wrote, you know, I don't try to predict the markets, but I don't think this is going to be like a one week thing, this little, the very first jolt. I think this is going to be more serious than, the market is going to take this more seriously than, than people think. And the next three weeks, of course, stocks went straight down. And then I thought I was a genius, you know, and that's, a, that's the easiest way to lose money. And so, so it was, uh, it, it confirmed my false belief that I knew what I was doing. And um, so I, I think this is a one-time thing. You know, never say never, but at least it's going to, I've touched the, I touched the stove, it was hot, and I'm not going back near that stove for a while now, if ever. I wanted to ask you, we recently um, had uh, Professor uh, Lawrence Cunningham of George Washington University on the podcast, and he's written a number of books, but one of his books what, uh, is titled Dear, Dear Shareholder, and he's, he, what, what he's doing there is he's highlighting um, shareholder letters from great CEOs and, and communicators, and one of the people that he hi highlights in that book and that he actually mentioned on the podcast was the founder of Morningstar, um, Joe, Joe, Joe Masueto. Um, and he sort of talked about, you know, just at a high level, his ability to communicate uh, really well with uh, shareholder and his shareholder letters. And so what I wanted just to ask you is given, you know, the success of Morningstar and, you know, what are some of the lessons that you learned from Joe, whether it's in business or life, that you think you know our listeners might be able to um, also learn from. Are there any stories that you know you can share with us? First, to address your question on shareholder letters, when I joined Morningstar in 1988, um, new employees were greeted with uh, the most recent copy of the Berkshire Hathaway annual report. Hmm. So Joe had discovered Berkshire Hathaway when he was in business school circa 1980, maybe even before then, and was a, um, was a fervent fan. So, it, you know, it's not surprising, surprising that the Morningstar shareholder letters are considered to be pretty good given that's Joe's model, is reading the Berkshire, Berkshire Hathaway letters. And um, it's just always been important to him. He's, he, he loved the idea that that Warren Buffett wrote to his audience as if they were investors like him and people like him and didn't, didn't talk down to them, but tried to share their thoughts. And it, it just felt, you know, honest and, and we're in this together. And that, and that's really Joe, Joe's a builder. Um, you know, I come from a family that's actually not a business family. It's a, it was a family of school teachers and government workers and it tended to be pretty skeptical of entrepreneurs. You know, my family, we thought of entrepreneurs as, as backslappers and deal makers and people would tell you something to get the, to make the sale, but short term thinking, you know, Joe is, was so different than, than what I was raised to believe. Joe's a very, very long term thinker, many years out uh, and a builder. And he liked, he, from the very beginning, when we were a little company, we had a million dollars in sales. 18 people, so you divide that, make 18 people divided by a million in revenues plus rent and pub printing and all that and advertising, you, you know how it goes. It's, um, there wasn't a lot of money for the, for anybody, including Joe, to draw, to take a salary from. And he was talking about when the company would be doing 100 million in business or 500 million or a billion. And he knew it wasn't going to be next year or the year after. That's just how he is. So he, he, he's extremely optimistic. And, um, you know, it exposed me to the positive side of entrepreneurship and capitalism and just trying to make something, just trying to make something. And it was, it was really cool. You know, it's good for all of us to, to see something that's, that's different than, than how we're raised and broaden our viewpoint. Yeah, I think Morningstar has, uh, what is it, like 6,000 employees now, something like that. So Yeah, I don't even know. That sounds from, about right. From 18 in an apartment, you know, and you hear these, I mean, that's how these great companies are founded. They're founded by, you know, long-term thinkers, um, you know, out of a garage or out of an apartment. And, you know, it's like the struggle, the grind, the grit, 
the optimism, the creativity, you know, you really need to have all those ingredients to, to make it and survive. And then, you know, and many of the companies that do survive, they don't become anywhere near, they don't become publicly traded companies like a Morningstar, you know? So it really is. Um, I know the person, I know the person who was there, the first employee, part-time employee when Joe had, was working out of his apartment and what she says is, I never believed he could do this. <laughs> <laughs> she doubts him every day. <laughs> well, it's pretty amazing. Um, all right. So to, so to wrap it up, we thought, I thought I'd just try to have a little fun here um, and test your knowledge on American literature. I think this is a pre pretty easy setup for you. So, but let's see. Um, no, so I was an English major, but it was mostly English literature. So okay. <laughs> well, we'll see. I think this is. So where, do, where does this quote come from and how does it relate to you? And the quote is, the sun is but a morning star. Oh, well, yeah, there you go. That's from Thoreau. Um, on Walden Pond or Walden, I always forget the name of the book. I actually read the book in, in my class. Oh, that was well before I was. It was, it was, it was, it was Walden, so you're right. It was yep. Walden, yes. And, and, I, and I, visited the, uh, I visited the little house, the reconstruction they did, by the way, a couple of years back just really? outside in the Boston area. It's very small. You can see why it was so cheap for him to build. Um, and Joe will tell you, Joe selected that as Morning, the Morningstar has the company name because of that quote. And Joe will tell you stories about the philosophy behind it. But the truth is he chose it because it just feels optimistic, mm -hmm. the morning star. It's like this Japan sun rising, you know? Mm -hmm. and by the way, he loves Japan. He's, he's a Japanophile. Um, but it's just, you know, the, the morning star rising, the, the idea that you've got this whole huge future ahead of you. And that's, that's how the company got its name. That's great. You got, you got that one right. I knew, I knew you would. Jack was like, what are we going to ask him? He was worried that we weren't going to get it, but you nailed it. You nailed it. I'm glad you didn't ask me Hawthorne. No. <laughs> So listen, John, thanks so much for jumping on with us. Um, if people want to go and just learn more about you, your writing, um, and what's, you know, what your latest thoughts are, where should they go to find out more? Morningstar.com, one word, Morningstar. And I'm free. They don't charge for me. So I'm, I, and I'll be on the homepage somewhere. Right at the top of the homepage if I publish that day, but I'll, I'll still be there. So Great. Google me. There's not many reconcilers around. And only one John, as far as I know. Well, and we're still waiting for you to get on Twitter, but that might be a, that might be a long shot, but maybe we can convince you. <laughs> I've got a lot of people pestering me at the office, including my boss. So if oh. my boss doesn't have success, you probably won't. <laughs> right. <laughs> all right. Well, listen, thank you very much for uh, jumping on with us today. It was a good discussion and uh, wish you all the best. Thanks, Justin. Thank you. Bye-bye. Hi guys, this is Justin again. Thanks so much for tuning into this episode of Excess Returns. You can follow Jack on Twitter at, at @practicalquant and follow me on Twitter at, at JJ Carboneau. If you found this discussion interesting and valuable, please subscribe in either iTunes or on YouTube or leave a review or a comment. We appreciate it.